All right, so we're now moving into material covering reacting mixtures. Now, uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about still ideal gas mixtures that react, but you have to pay attention. Sometimes um, the fuel that we have uh, is maybe not coming into the system in, as an ideal gas. Maybe it comes in liquid. Uh, so you just have to pay attention. But a lot of times uh, the mixtures are... Uh, uh, ideal gases. Also, we're going to be dealing with combustion. So combustion is a particular type of reaction. So we have a reaction equation. We're on the left-hand side of the equation. We have the reactants. On the right-hand side, we have the products. And this symbol right here indicates that it's um, not reversible. It, it, it moves such that you don't have any of uh, reactants left over if that reaction occurs. Uh, we'll model it such that, yeah, we could have some unburned hydrocarbons, but um, if it goes, it's not like it's reversible. If it's reversible, you have this harpoon and this harpoon, this symbol in between, and that's next chapter where we'll deal with reversible reactions, chemical reactions, okay? and the equilibrium where you have, uh, after a long time, allowing everything to happen, you'll have some products and some reactants, some stuff that's on the left-hand side, some stuff that's on the right-hand side of that balanced re reaction equation, and it'll be all in equilibrium. But here, if you let it where it matched up, it would go, everything would go to the products. Okay, so what do we have? Our typical combustion is we have some fuel and some oxidizer. The products, let's spend a little bit of talking about our time talking about our fuel. So our hydrocarbon fuel, there's three that you should know. There's many more than that, but uh, let's talk about methane. What's it? It's CH4. That's methane. Um, where do you have any experience with the combustion of methane? In your house with a hot water heater that may be natural gas? That's all natural gas. That's methane. Natural gas is methane. Okay. Uh, anybody ever see a, a gas stove in the kitchen with a blue flame? Yeah. yeah, that's methane. Now you could also have <coughs> propane stove if you don't have a gas line provided to your neighborhood or your house. And that propane is C3H8. So you could have a propane stove, it would burn. But also, anybody have a barbecue pit? Yeah. Now, some barbecue pits, I guess if you live in a nice neighborhood, they have the natural gas line running out there to the barbecue pit. But most of the time, you have a propane tank. A little white cylinder holds, what, 20, 25 pounds of, of uh, propane. You, uh, you can buy it and re return the cylinder, get a new, fresh uh, cylinder. I don't know what they cost. I, I just see them all over grocery stores and lumber yards, other places, and that's buying propane, okay? Uh, you can pick it up, it's very heavy, and you can actually uh, take the can and feel the sloshing. What does that indicate about the phase of the propane in the tank? It's two phase, and so there's gonna be some liquid in the presence of gravity settled to the bottom, and above it, some of that vapor, so it's two phase. And then C3, C8H18, also it's called octane. Well, the, sounds like gasoline. Uh, when you go to the store and buy some gasoline, what form is the hydrocarbon coming into your gas tank? Liquid, it's liquid. So you see a trend. What's the trend going this way? Higher molar mass. More carbon, more hydrogen, true? And uh, this is typically liquid at very modest pressures and temperatures. Uh, propane, well, it's pressurized, but it's liquid at some modest temperatures and pressurized. Uh, when it comes out and what you burn is a flame where it's gas burning off. But what about methane? Do you have any experience with liquid methane? No, you need negative 160 degrees, you know, it's cryogenic type temperatures to have it 
liquid, you can get liquid methane, but often it's very expensive to make it liquid because it's, you have a, a lot of refrigeration to cool it down. Uh, so we transport uh, methane in pipes, pipelines. And that's why a lot of us don't have it in our houses because they didn't get a pipeline out to that subdivision or that location. How do you transport propane? Well, uh, you pick it up in a tank and you carry it in a shopping cart or by hand, or the truck comes out and has a big propane tank on the back of it and it recharges your propane tank for your house. What is the phase at which it's transferring the propane into that tank? It's liquid, liquid, yeah, it's liquid liquid propane, okay? And then how, how do we transport uh, uh, octane? Well, it would be with a truck, you know, service coming to the gas station. You would then transfer it out of the ho with a hose into your tank. It's liquid, liquid. Now, you also have pipelines to move this liquid because it's so prevalent. <laughs> and uh, so you can have pipelines to move liquids. But if you're needing to move a gas, uh, you don't fit a lot of gas and you don't really want high pressure gas tanks or, or vessels uh, because one big rupture or punch and you have a big accident, <laughs> okay? Usually we have accidents and the gasoline spills but it doesn't turn into a fireball. But uh, the, when, you're moving, when you're moving gaseous methane, you're doing it in a pipeline. Uh, now, what about the products? This is just something you, hate, you have to know, that the carbon, see, this is a hydrocarbon. Carbons are in the fuel. And then the hydrogen is in the fuel. That's our simple hydrocarbon. We're going to combust it, okay? Happens all the time. That carbon that's in the fuel, where does it go? It likes to go to carbon dioxide. First time you see this, you have to say, why? Why doesn't it just go to carbon monoxide or carbon trioxide? or carbon C2O2. Well, the electrons and the configurations and the valence isn't happy. Where is life happy? Right here. Oops, CO2 is happy, right? That's study of chemistry. CO, you can still combust it and get some more heat out. Uh, I don't know anything about this or this, but it's from my experience, what I know is that's not happy. Now, first time you see this, you're saying, you know, why does it just like to go to CO2? All right, same thing with the hydrogen. The hydrogens come off and they go to H2O. They don't go to HO. They don't like to go to H2O2, et cetera. So I told this joke earlier, I'll tell it now. It's a ninth grade joke, first year of chemistry in high school. True? The student just learns water is H2O. So they go into the store or the restaurant. The waiter says, what would you like to drink? I'll have some H2O. Ooh, he knows he's looking for water. I'll bring you that. So he turns to the other. He says, what would you like? I'd like some H2O too. They got their two glasses. One drank, the other drank and died. <laughs> I think this is what they call hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> so don't order H2O too. <laughs> That's a really funny joke, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Eighth grade. So that's where the hydrogen likes to go. Now you're armed with studying combustion. But where do we get the oxygen from? Where do we get that oxidizer? Well, if you're NASA and uh, you really want to get a large kick out of a rocket and you're using combustion and you're throwing it through a nozzle and you're pushing it off, you don't want anything but pure oxygen, okay? But that's, I think everybody understands this symbol, expensive. When you wanna combust with your grill, barbecuing, you buy the propane, you're not gonna buy a pure bottle of oxygen. That would be outrageously expensive. Oh, you could do it, but it'd be outrageously expensive. Uh, likewise, in your burning on your cook stove or your hot water heater or your car, automobile engine, you don't buy pure oxygen. So you want to get the oxygen from the air, but the air has primarily nitrogen. What is the mole percent of nitrogen in the air that we breathe? Uh, 79 percent. 0.79 is the mole fraction. So I know that we have argon and carbon dioxide and water vapor, but oh, just lump them all in with the nitrogen. 
and left over good air outside where it hasn't been you know, put through people's lungs or put through engines, it's around 21% by mole. Such that, listen carefully, if you have one kilomole of air, and we're considering this air as diatomic, made up only of nitrogen and oxygen, if I ingest one kilomole of air, I will only bring in 0.21 kilomoles of ox oxygen. That's it. So I'll have 0.79 kilomoles of N2. A lot of times we don't put it like that. We just have it like this. One, the stoichiometric coefficient in front of air, is equal to 0.21 O2s and 0.79 N2s. True? Here's a math quiz. If I wanted to get one kilomole of oxygen, how many kilomoles of nitrogen are going to go along for the ride? And how many kilomoles total of air go that I have to ingest if I want one kilomole of oxygen? Wouldn't you take this equation, multiply by 1 over 0.21, that would turn this coefficient to one kilomole of oxygen. And when you do the math, 0.79 over 0.21, 3.76. Do you have a calculator? Can you verify? 3.76, meaning for every kilomole of oxygen that I get out of the air, I need 3.76 kilomoles of nitrogen to go for the ride. And when you do the math, guess what this is? 4.76. True? Round it off to three significant digits. True? All right. So, let me repeat, if you're getting air, oxygen from air, which is per, often is the case, you need to ingest 4.76 kilomoles of air to get one kilomole of oxygen. You have to bring along 3.76 kilomoles of nitrogen with that one kilomole of oxygen. Very good. So now let's talk about the stoichiometric coefficients. Let's just pick a fuel. We have a hydrocarbon fuel, C3H8, also known as, I forgot the name of this one. Why not memorize those three right away? What is methane? What is propane? And what is octane? That's right. Just memorize them. You can do it, right? So if I'm going to take this and I'm going to ingest some oxygen, but the oxygen is going to come from the air that we breathe. The engine is going to breathe or whatever, the burner is going to breathe. So it's going to bring back with it, this is N2, 3.76. So that's the way I write it. So this is, if I, I'm looking, I'm going to balance this equation in a minute, but I'm going to find a stoichiometric coefficient in front of the O2 but that's the same number that's in front of the 3.76 N2 to have the right proportion of oxygen and nitrogen. All right, where does the carbon go? It all goes to CO2 for complete combustion. Where does the hydrogen go? H2O. H2O. So let's just do this now for complete combustion. Let me uh, move this over a little bit. Okay, so... Uh, I'm not going to have any oxygen going out, but I'll have the nitrogen going out. And I'll put that 3.76 sitting there, and I'll figure this out in a minute, the coefficient out there. All right. So I want to balance my reaction equation by picking or finding or deducing these stoichiometric coefficients. coefficients. So uh, first off, you can do this by setting up a little A and a little B, a little C and a little D, and you get four equations and four unknowns, and the four equations would come from a carbon balance equation, come from a hydrogen balance equation, come from an oxygen balance equation, come from a nitrogen balance equation. Four equations, four unknowns. The trick in a lot of these cases is, is you can just go and... Do the, do the carbon balance alone, because the only place you see carbon is right here and right there. I can determine A right away, the coefficient A. So the carbon balance would be, here I'll leave the A there, 3 on the left-hand side 
must equal 3 on the right-hand side, and that's a times 1, because there's a 1 right there on the C. There was, and so guess what? This coefficient right there is 3. Bingo. Now let's do the hydrogen balance. I have 8 here. 8 is equal to any there? None. B times 2. So I deduce B is 4. You do this a couple times and you have the pattern down. Now let's do the oxygen balance. I'll have C times 2 is equal to 3 times 2 plus 4 times 1. True? So this is 6 plus 4, that's 10. C is 5. There's 5. And if you do the nitrogen balance, you just find D is also 5. How many people have done these <laughs> chemistry classes? Deja vu. Yeah, okay. Well, there you go. Okay, refresh your memory. So this is now with what we call 100% theoretical air, the perfect amount of air. You could also have what they call excess air. What's that mean, excess air? Too much. Maybe somebody says it's 20% excess air. Well, what I do is I write down and get it to be balanced with 100% theoretical air, then take that equation, rewrite it, modify it. So I'd say, okay, Here's my 100%. Now I want to give it, do it with 20%. C3H8 plus 5, little, leave a little space there, O2 plus 3.76N2 goes to 3CO2 plus 4H2O plus leave a little space with oxygen plus 5, leave a little space, 3.76N2. After you've done a few of these, you, you see the pattern. So if I have excess air, that means I didn't just bring in 100%. I brought in 120%, 1.2. Did that make sense? So I take that 5 and multiply by 1.2. Agree? Do you follow that? So now I have too much, too much air. Does it change the 3 in front of the CO2? No, because I didn't change the 1 in front of the fuel. Does it change the 4 in front of the H2O? No, because I didn't change the 1 in front of the fuel. But what happens is, is I have 0.2 times 5 left over, unused oxygen. True? And I'll have 1.2 times 5 because the nitrogen just goes through the, for the ride. It just goes through the system. <coughs> so there it's been balanced for excess. Now, deficient is a little more challenging. Why? Because you didn't give it enough oxygen for all the fuel to combust. So you could have it where some of the fuel does nothing and the fuel that was lucky enough to get matched up with the oxygen, goes to complete combustion, or you could have the problem of having some CO2 and some CO. And there usually needs to be more information added when you have deficient air because the carbon doesn't go all the way to carbon dioxide. Some of it gets stuck in CO. Okay, which one of these are very, very deadly to breathe in? CO, carbon monoxide. Uh, what will happen if you breathe a lot of carbon monoxide? <laughs> Done. You're dead, right? Now, it used to be that if a person wanted to do suicide, don't ever even think of that thought, but they would take the car, put it in the garage, start it up, and just sit there and wait. They would die of carbon monoxide poisoning. With catalytic converters, guess what? Last 20 years, you'll just wake up and you have a empty gas tank and probably and probably a headache so that's about all you're gonna get empty gas tank and a headache but that's with the catalytic converters see cleans it all up all right okay
I shouldn't have mentioned that either, should I? <laughs> we just solved this problem. We said propane is the fuel. Uh, get it with 100% theoretical air and then modify that equation with 20% excess. All right. So this was the solution. Let me do this. I'm going to capture this one. I'm going to capture both of them. Do that edit, copy. Because the next problem says continue on, but this time for part C, do it with 90% of the propane is consumed in the reaction, meaning 10% doesn't combust at all. Does not combust at all. Okay? So what I would do is I would pull this out of the way. We'll use that in a minute. But we'll go and we'll start with the 100% theoretical air equation and we'll modify it. We'll say, you know what? Over here, there's going to be some, I'm going to wrap around the equation. There's going to be some C3H8 that comes out. How much? Well, 100% went in, 90% is combusted, 10% goes out uncombusted. So what goes out is 0 0.10. Now, again, I, every semester I get asked this question. I was asked already at 9 o'clock. Somebody in this room is probably, they're really being tortured because they see that 0.1, and they see that 3.76, and they see that 0.2, and they're just going, ah, this is conflicting with my, all of my high school chemistry. What is it conflicting with? They're not integers. And they're not ratios of you know, integers and fractions. But that's OK, relax. Because what it is, is we can have 0.1 or 1 tenth of a kilomole. No problem. OK? So that's what you think. You think of these stoichiometric coefficients like how many kilomoles, which is a large number of entities. OK. All right. Now, we come back here, and we're going to modify this equation because 0.9 went to make the CO2 and the H2O. Only 90% of the fuel was combusted, hence only 90% of what we would expect of the CO2 and H2O is produced. <coughs> True? At this point, I just balanced, or we just balanced the carbon. True? Can you double check the carbon balance? You got three over here. You get a 0 0.9 times 3 plus 0.1 times 3. Does it balance the carbon? And then the hydrogen, does that balance? Sure, it balances. Um, how about the oxygen? It doesn't quite balance, does it? Yeah. We're going to have some unused oxygen. We had 100% of what we needed, but we're only going to use, guess how much of it? If you're only burning 90% of the fuel, you're only going to use 90% of what you, so 10% of what was supplied, the perfect match, is left over. So how much O2 goes out? Five times 0.1? Look good. Balance it. Just check it. Say, let's do the oxygen balance. When in doubt, so you'll have 5 times 2, and then you'll have 0.9 times 3 times 2 plus 4 times 1 plus 0.1 times 5 times 2. So let me expand that out. This is uh, 6 and 4, that's 10. 10 times 0 0.9 is 9. Plus, over here I have 10 times 0 0.1, 1. It's 10 is 10. 10 is 10. OK? So it, it checks. Uh, then you can do the nitrogen balance, but I think the nitrogen is, is balanced. So there is our modified equation uh, for part C. How about part D? 90% of the propane consumed in the reaction with 20% excess air. 
Go get the excess air equation. Get that right. Theoretical, then the 20% excess. This is where we're at. Now we're going to modify that equation, okay? So draw a line. This is uh, everything above is part C. Now everything below is part D. Now what we want to do is we want to say only 90% is used. So C3H8 goes to, uh, I'm, I'm still going to have 1.2 times 5 times O2 plus 3.76N2. Okay. It's going to go to uh, 0.9 times 3CO2 plus 4H2Os plus 0.1 times C3H8. So I got the carbon and we have the hydrogen balanced just like we did before. Now what about the oxygen? Well, we're still going to have the 0.2 times 5 O2s, but we're going to get more because it was uncombusted. So we get uh, 0.1 times 1.2 times 5. And that should balance out the oxygen. Double check the oxygen. What's 5 times 1.2? 6. 6 times 2? 12. I have 12 O's on the left hand side. Okay, let's come over here. I have 3 times 2, 6, plus 4, that's 10. 10 times 0 0.9, 9. So I have 12 goes to 9, okay, or it should equal 9 plus, nothing over here. How about right in here? This is 6 times 0 0.1, so it's 0 0.6 plus, what's 5 times 10? Point two. Point one. Oh, one. It's one. It's one. So we have uh, that's six point six one, and then you multiply by two. So this is one point six. One point six times two. That's a. Uh, this doesn't look like it's going to work out. I think that 1.2 is supposed to be 0.9 times 1.2? Uh, yeah, just 0.1 times your next year, 1.2 in your top spot. Uh, hold it, right here? Never mind. Is that supposed to be? You covered it. Uh, 6.6, .6, hold it, 5, 6.6, 0. 0.2 times 5, 1, 1. 1.6. Point this point 0.2? Uh, that's exactly right. Yeah, it's a one. That's a one right there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, so it's a one right there, because I it was only the theoretical error. Ten percent of the theoretical error is left over, so that becomes point five. One point five times two is three, so we have three plus nine. It's Twelve. Bingo. Check your work. Okay, um, check your work when you're doing homework. Why? Because you get efficient at checking your work, and when you're doing it during the test, you can be a little more efficient with your time. All right. So there you go. That's the answer. Then we well, I have to finish out the nitrogen. The nitrogen didn't change. It's 1.2 times 5 times 3.76 N2. Make sense? All right. How about the air-to-fuel ratio and the fuel-to-air ratio? 
Well, these are parameters that can be expressed on either a mass basis or a motor basis. So if somebody says, calculate the air to fuel on a motor basis, isn't that notation what we've used for a motor basis? That would be defined as the number of moles of air divided by the number of moles of fuel. Let's go back and look at our, our combustion of propane right here this, uh, with 100% theoretical air. Okay? So if we go back and look at this equation for propane, let me copy it and then I'll bring it to that other page. Edit, copy, copy, edit, paste. And somebody says, I want you to calculate the air to fuel ratio on a molar basis for this combustion, 100% uh, propane with 100% theoretical air. You could say, okay, well, the number of moles of air is 5 times 1 plus 3.76 or 5 times 4.76, right? That would be the number of moles of air that are shown right here in this equation. Okay. And the number of moles of fuel? One. One. Uh, did I mention that whenever you have a reaction equation, pick one as the stoichiometric coefficient in front of your fuel and don't change it. You will typically be very tempted to change it, thinking that you have a devised a more clever algorithm to solve the problem by now changing the stoichiometric coefficient from the fuel. Don't do it. Or know that you're about ready to head down a long dead end. Or just a more circuitous, whatever, convoluted path to solve it. Just leave the one in front of the coefficient for the fuel. It makes life a lot easier. Okay. Um, and for a short answer, typically we have four balance equations. And if you have now five parameters out there, A, B, C, D, and E, I'm now going to solve for E. Great. This is just super. Five balance equations, five with four, I'm sorry, four balance equations with five unknowns. You better have a lot of mathematical muscle to be able to solve that problem because it's set up wrong. Right? Too many unknowns and not enough equations. So leave a one there. Done. Okay. So you could calculate this. Anybody run this number yet? 5 times 4.76, whatever that number is. That's the molar air to fuel ratio. Okay. 23.8. 23.8. What does it mean? It means for every mole of fuel, I need 23.8 moles of air. How about on a mass basis? They say calculate the air to fuel ratio on a mass basis. Mass of air divided by mass of fuel. Well, if I knew the number of moles of air and I mold, multiplied by the molar mass of air, 28.97, wouldn't that do it? And if I knew the number of moles of fuel and I multiplied by the molar mass of fuel for uh, propane, it's uh, 12 times 3 plus 8 for each of the carbons around 12. Each of the hydrogens, about one, and that comes in at what? 44.0 something. I don't remember the last out there. But you look it up in the table, it's 44 with some change. The total break at the AS is 13.95. So when you put in the 28.97, the 44 something, you get the air to fuel on a mass basis to be. So it's going to be 23.8. Is that right? 23.8? Yeah. Okay. 28.97 divided by around 44.0. 15.7 is, a, it sounds right. 15.7. So, how do I interpret this? It says I'm going to have to ingest 15.7 kilograms of air with every kilogram of fuel. Or I have to have 15.7 pounds of air per pound of fuel. How many people ever tune the fuel injection system in automobiles and they look at the air to fuel? You don't want it lit rich, you don't want it lean, you want it spot on. Anybody recognize 15.7? That's about it, okay? You'll see that number. Or they'll flip it. 
they'll flip it and they'll describe the fuel to air ratio. Well, that's one over the air to fuel ratio. And you can do it on a mass basis as well as a molar basis. All right. Um, consider complete combustion with propane with 100% theoretical air. Obtain the balanced reaction equation. Be very good at that. And then do the air to fuel ratio on a motor on a mass. We just did that. And then the mole fraction of water vapor in the products. Let's, let's finish this problem out. So if I look here and I say the mole fraction of water vapor in the products. True? Well, I'll have four moles of water, and I'll have three moles of carbon dioxide, four moles of water, and five times 3.76 moles of N2. And so there's the mole fraction of water vapor in, now run this number, see what you get. It's around 16% on a molar basis is water vapor. That's a lot of water vapor going out. That's why when you see coming out of a tailpipe, gets into a cold environment, you get the little wisp, the white cloud, the, 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 uh, it's hit the dew point, and it's now condensing. Oh, then the dew point temperature. How am I going to calculate the dew point temperature? Well, if I know Y of the H2O is 0.16 rounded off, right? then I can get the partial pressure of the vapor as a total pressure, 101.3 kilopascals, standard atmospheric pressure, sea level, times Y of H2O. And then I need to find where that dew point temperature gives the saturation pressure equal to the partial pressure of the vapor in the moist air mixture. Really, I wouldn't call it moist air mixture. I mean, it's an ideal gas mixture, but you don't want to be breathing it. That's exhaust uh, after combustion. There's not a lot of oxygen in it, is there? By our equation, there was none. By our equation, how much oxygen's there? You're not going to be happy breathing that. All right? All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop. And